Markets were in a celebratory mood as we crossed into our fifth year as an organization here at Market Scholars, and the S&P 500 went up for the fifth time in the last six trading sessions. Not only that, but the Russell 2000 actually went up to enough today to close at its highest closing price since all the way back on January 18th. And then we also saw over 70% of the components within the market close higher here today. So we'll take a look at all that evidence, see what it means for our posture moving forward. And then I wanted to take a look at a trade application example where we kind of fade this move and do a rare bearish trade after we've had a better setup pricing wise here with the rally in the markets in the last several sessions. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's March 22nd, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click on subscribe, then go ahead and sign up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. Remember, at the bottom of those email lists, you'll also find any stocks in the S&P 500 that are giving us overbought or oversold cluster signals on those days. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. And we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these market outlook related posts. Last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. Let's get started here with our heat map of the S&P 500. And you can see it was quite the celebratory day. Uh, we were celebrating our four year anniversary uh, at Market Scholars here uh, in the last 24 hours. And it looks like the party continued on here uh, within uh, the stock market itself. Uh, all kidding aside, we really appreciate those of you that have been premium members, and also those of you that have watched these free videos of ours over the last four years, and we're looking forward to another four years in front of us. But as you can see, lots of green here in the stock market today. Uh, some of the bigger squares, of course, stand out. Those are the ones that have the larger market caps and therefore are more influential on the S&P 500. And so the one that probably stands out and, and catches your eye the most is right there, and that is Tesla. Tesla was the largest mover on the upside in the market here today, and it was up nearly 8% there. Uh, you can see right above it was Amazon, it was up 2%, and then all the big behemoths off on the left-hand side were up as well. Microsoft up 1.6%, Apple up 2%, uh, and then Alphabet up 2.8%. Uh, Facebook was also up about 2.5% there, so uh, you can kind of get a sense that the whole FANG trade uh, has at least been you know, starting to put it together more recently compared to what we had been seeing in recent months. So that's a positive sign for the overall market because it would be difficult for this market to gain bullish headway without the support of the largest components. Most of them are those fan, those FANG stocks. Now one uh, that you'll wanna be aware of for after hours tonight, it's not a FANG stock, but it is certainly growing in heft over the years, and that is Adobe. This is now a $220 billion company. So uh, I think if you would have asked somebody 15 years ago if the maker of Photoshop software and PDF files would be worth $200 billion, they would have laughed you out the building, but that's where we find ourselves right now. Anyway, that particular stock did close the session here at 466, however, after hours, the stock is down tremendously, uh, and so expect that one to pull back maybe 20, 30 bucks per share tomorrow. I'm not sure if that has the uh, impact to kind of put a wet blanket on the otherwise somewhat bullishness out of the tech space, but just put it on your radar just in case that does come to fruition. In terms of some of our losing areas of the day, you can see that energy was on the red side of the equation vast majority of those energy stocks, those oil and gas companies in the S&P 500 did close lower today. Exxon down 0.44%, Chevron down 0.33%. So you'll notice that those were not large declines. Uh, it's just the consistency of 
the majority of energy companies that kind of catches your eye right there. Oil prices themselves have continued to stay very robust uh, despite what has seemed to be maybe a cooling off in um, you know what's going on with the R Russia Ukraine situation obviously still a war going on there but it doesn't seem like investors are keen in on the risks as a result of that war quite as much as they were uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, many of you know that I was out of the state out of office uh, last week at least late last week and surprisingly the stock market was up nearly every day that I was away. And so I was joking with our premium members here uh, that uh, if, 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 you, if you need somebody to take one for the team, we could all start a, a pool and send me off to a, a vacation again. If that's all it takes is for me to be out of the office for the market to go up 1% every day, uh, happy to do that for you. Uh, but of course, uh, in this particular environment, um, I come back to the markets in a much more stable um, kind of marketplace than where I left it, and that is an encouraging sign moving forward. Uh, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Obviously, we're still a long ways away from all-time highs, but uh, there is maybe growing evidence that perhaps last week or two weeks ago, whenever that was, that we hit the bottom, uh, maybe that was a more substantial kind of intermediate term bottom for the time being, and uh, we can have some bullishness moving forward. Obviously, the more days we see like this, where we have more green than red, uh, the greater the chance is that that is uh, a possibility. Let's go ahead and take a look here at the uh, main part of the platform now and wanted to show you from a breadth perspective where things fell and as you're probably not surprised to learn there were more bullish stocks today than bearish stocks the s p 500 was up more than one percent and so you will see here in the s p 500 361 stocks uh, managed to close in the green and only 138 fell into the red so that's about a 72 percent positive hit rate there and so it's a sign that it wasn't just the fang stocks that were up today uh, there were plenty of uh, soldiers within the army in addition to those generals that advanced here today and that is a sign of a healthier uh, stock market than uh, what we had been witnessing for much of 2022 thus far where more times than not we saw uh, more than half of the market components in the red. So uh, we could get used to this. This is a nicer feeling, of course, as most of us uh, have our vast majority of our wealth and our uh, you know investable assets to the long side of the market. So uh, every so often, we have to go through rough patches like we just saw here in recent months. Uh, but in general, we have to remind ourselves that the stock market starts in the lower left and it ends in the upper right uh, with, of course, many speed bumps along the way. But um, in general, um, companies figure out ways to become more profitable and they become worth more in the investor's eyes as a result of those increased profitability and therefore the stock prices generally follow suit over the long term. So uh, I'm always a little bit happier uh, when the stock market is rising as it has been in the last week as opposed to what we had witnessed at the first part of 2022. Let's also take a look here at some of our charts. And I wanted to bring up this chart. Some of you might have caught on Twitter here a moment ago that I actually posted a screenshot of this. So I'll show you here real briefly on Twitter where that is. There it is. And I was just saying that the S&P 500 has closed higher by at least 1% in five out of the last six trading days. The last time that happened was back during the first week of November of 2020, which was when we got that Pfizer vaccine data. And that really started to give the market some encouragement that perhaps we'd be finding our way out of the whole COVID lockdown sooner rather than later. Whether that happened or not since November 2020, I'll let each one of you uh, decide. I was in a, a place that was quite crowded last weekend and I didn't see a whole lot of people wearing masks there. So I'd like to think that we're we're kind of on the other side of that hump and finding our way uh, to uh, hopefully victory over that terrible uh, health pandemic that we were all dealing with back then. But that kind of goes to show you um, how aggressive the buying has been in the last week, that the last time we've seen anything like this was a year and a half ago when we actually had really good 
um, you know, economic news or news that would, you know, directly affect the economy with uh, the vaccine information. And so you can kind of see what that looks like here on the Twitter screenshot where you've got all of these bars, these green bars piling up above that blue horizontal line right there. Remember that blue line is the 1% price move. When the bars are green, it means it's an up move of 1%. When the bars are red, it's a down move of 1%. And so you can barely make it out here, but I'll kind of circle it with my mouse. That was yesterday's candle that I'm pointing at, and it was just a tiny little red blip that shows up. Uh, and compared to all of these giant green towers that surround it, uh, it's a reminder that we have had an amazing run here in just five or six trading sessions with the only down day being yesterday, which looks like that in terms of a candlestick, uh, which is barely a down day. It just, you know, it was more of a kind of a, a doji uh, looking type of a, of a feel there. Um, and so it, uh, it barely closed just a little bit lower. So uh, you could get away with calling yesterday um, more of a, of a flat day uh, as opposed to a true down day. And it's surrounded by nothing but 1% winning days. That is uh, quite the run uh, that these uh, stocks in the S&P 500 have had in a very, very short amount of time. You'll also notice down below in the uh, purple here uh, that the VIX has fallen into the low 20s now, right around 23 as we speak. And remember, it wasn't so long ago where I was rattling off the statistics to you guys here about how the VIX had stayed, kind of overstayed its welcome uh, above 30 and how rare that was, how normally throughout history, once we got above 30, we didn't really stay above 30. We would spike above it and we'd immediately come down. But what was strange about this most recent time is that it stayed above 30 for many days in a row. We finally seen the damn break, so to speak, uh, on that particular instance, and now the VIX has rolled over. And that means, you know, all of you that have been selling options premium during that higher volatility time, you're probably benefiting to some degree by watching this VIX roll over. Uh, those of you that have been watching this video consistently in the last couple of months will know that the trade that I've done by far and away the most often, you guys are probably getting sick of them by now, uh, but they are the sold put trades. Uh, over and over and over again, I was telling you guys that I wanted to do the, the, the sold put trades because I like doing them on days when the stock market's getting hammered. I want to be brave and step up and look for merchandise that might be considered babies being thrown out with the bathwater. So it doesn't take too long, in this case just a week's worth of time, to remind those of you who maybe uh, fought against the urge to do sold put trades of your own to see where that benefit could have come from. Now, naturally, had you done different options trades, you might have done even better than that. But I can tell you that our sold put trades have done really well now that we've seen the market itself rebound away from where our strike prices would have been below us. And we've had the added benefit of seeing volatility in the VIX rolling over. And that is making those put contracts worth less. Remember, we want to sell them when they're expensive and buy them back when they're cheap. And one of those options components components that helps the pricing model is when Vega assists you by seeing volatility rolling over. So congrats to those of you who, like me, uh, may have been selling puts much more aggressively in the last couple of months compared to what you typically would have done under different volatility regimes. Uh, those trades have worked out quite nicely. All right, let's go ahead and get back on over here now. Uh, to the actually since we're over here on the internet let's 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 clear this as well since uh, it's here staring me in the face thank you to everybody who helped support uh, the market outlook video the last time I put it together which would have been a week ago 111 of you stepped up to click like for me remember anytime we're up and over uh, 100 I will plan on doing a full-length video which includes a trade application example like those sold puts that I had mentioned in fact the one I did just one week ago was Phillips 66 in that case and that one's been working out just fine as well despite it being an energy stock now um, in terms of the 111 people that that uh, clicked like for me last time around. Thank you to Brad and Roger and Adrian and other Roger, uh, Jeff and Fun Jonesy. I think that's Ken there. And then Rainier and Ed and Tom, uh, H. Raffin, uh, Dale, Teresa, Claire, Paul, Margie, Tim, Paul, 
Fred, Ken, Phil, Kirk, Serene, Rick, Surendhar, Ann, Dave, Doug, Prakash, and everybody else. There are too many of you to rattle off since there's over a hundred of them, but I do see you coming in and I do appreciate you. Thank you so much for your support of this free presentation here. It helps you guys uh, get these uh, uh, fuller length videos there. And so I do appreciate you getting the word out about our organization. As I mentioned here earlier, we have just crossed over into our fourth year of, um, or crossed past our, our fourth year, I should say. We're now into our fifth year of teaching classes here at Market Scholars, and it's kind of uh, crazy for my mind to come to terms with that as I, I still feel like half of the days that I wake up, I'm going to go pop in the shower and then head on down to the offices of TD Ameritrade like I used to in the old days. That's how, how close it is in my memory. But of course, we've been at it on our own here as David and I broke away uh, about four years ago or whatever it was to do our own thing here at Market Scholars. And we really appreciate your guys' help and support in that because you can imagine that being a two-person operation the way that we are, uh, we don't have a big advertising and marketing budget. So uh, our ability to get the word out about our fledgling organization is through uh, social media. So that's why we encourage you guys uh, to click like and retweet and all that kind of stuff as often as possible. Not only does it help us get the word out about our business, but it also helps you because the algorithms on Twitter and Facebook and all the rest will start to recognize what content you like and will kind of push you that content more regularly in the future there as well. So again, big thank you to all of you as we are celebrating our four-year anniversary and moving into our fifth year at this moment. Also, I'd like to point out that the sector selector was updated here over the weekend. We didn't really see a whole lot of change, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on this today. We still continue to have energy, utilities, materials, and real estate as our top four. But if there was a change, I think worth noting is what's going on here with the consumer staples. Notice the consumer staples here in this kind of pink or fuchsia colored has really rolled over quite considerably in just a month's worth of time. As you can imagine, the consumer staples are generally quite a boring area within the market and usually does not have dramatic movements uh, on the sector selector. It usually just kind of quietly comes and goes. This is more of a dramatic move for consumer staples purposes. And I think a lot of it is as a result of the expectation of increased input costs because of the rising commodities and all this other inflationary talk. And then you also have the disadvantage of many of those consumer staples pulling out of Russia. And of course, a lot of people applaud them for that, but it also does mean that those consumer staples companies like Coca-Cola and those types of companies are likely to uh, suffer a, a hit to their profits as a result of making that decision. And who knows if profits come in uh, short enough, it's possible it could have a negative impact on American workers who work for those uh, companies here in the headquarters in the United States uh, that, um, you know, sometimes you don't always think what the next move is. You just say, well, that's great, Coca-Cola, great job pulling out of Russia. We should teach Vlad, uh, Vladimir Putin a lesson, uh, tell him not to go to war with other nations, and this will teach him if Coca-Cola just pulls out of the nation. Well, uh, I would imagine that Vladimir doesn't really care, uh, for one, uh, and therefore it's probably not going to change much of anything. And secondly, uh, those that own those types of companies will very much uh, see those profits decline in those particular quarters. And then it could have the other impact of seeing American workers or others around the globe that aren't in Russia or wherever the, the hot button uh, country is at any moment in time lose their jobs as a result of that loss of profitability. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. And obviously, I support uh, Ukraine in this uh, entire tension, so I don't want to make it seem like it's coming off the opposite direction. But uh, I always like to kind of throw food for thought out there, right? Play the devil's advocate and uh, see how this impacts the markets and how they think about companies. I think that's part of the interest in the stock market for myself is just to recognize um, how changes take place and give me heightened interest in things that are happening around me all around the world. And, you know, this has been something that has been new and uh, we haven't seen a lot of historically. So it's been kind of interesting to learn from there. But the consumer staples do seem to be at a disadvantage right now for the reasons that I just mentioned. All right, let's go ahead and get back on over here to the main part of the platform. 
And let's go ahead and take a look at chart 4B. This is the market outlook for grid here. For those of you that are newer to this video, a reminder that the market outlook technical indicator you can find on Thinkorswim or on TD Ameritrade related resources, but you won't find it out there if you're operating with Fidelity or in, you know interactive brokers or something like that. But anyway, the market outlook video is uh, the one that's, or the market outlook, sorry, the market forecast. I, I got to be careful there. We, when David and I used to work for for TD Ameritrade, we actually used to call it uh, the 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 market forecast video. Uh, but then we were asked to change the name of our video once we left, so that's why we now call it the market outlook video. So sometimes I I intermingle those two when I shouldn't. But uh, the name of the video is market outlook. The name of the indicator is market forecast, and that's what you see down below here. And you'll notice that with our big move higher in the past week, it has tremendously changed the postures of all of these charts. And remember, that's what technical indicators are designed to do. All of them are backward looking to a degree. Uh, they're taking inputs from the past to spit out information in real time. And so with the big rebound in the market in the last week, notice what has happened to those green lines on the market forecast technical indicator down below. All of them have started rising. In fact, notice the Russell 2000's green line is in the upper reversal zone already. That's the first time we can make that claim on the Russell 2000 in the last three months. Today is the first time the green line is above 80. Uh, with some of these others, you can see like the Dow was uh, having its intermediate green line above 80 back here at the very beginning of this year. And with the S&P 500, it was kind of the same thing. So basically from mid-January on, the green lines for all four of these have been outside of the upper reversal zone and today is the first day that that changes with the Russell 2000 being up there at 81 so we would consider that to be obviously a strongly bullish posture and remember what I was you know working with you guys on in the last two or three weeks in this conversation that if we do go bullish in the markets that it is possible that the Russell 2000 becomes the leader in that effort and you can see that that is the case still today if you were to look at the labels the green labels in each of the four charts by far and away the intermediate line is the highest at about 82 right now compared to 62 on the nasdaq 68 on the s p 500 and 63 on the dow jones industrial average another thing that you know these charts make it easy or should make it easy for you to spot is look at the color of the moving average for the Russell 2000, the color of the 30-day moving average has been green for the last four trading sessions consistently, and you haven't seen it switch back and forth. You can't make that claim for any of the other uh, charts out there. With the NASDAQ, it's kind of been flipping back and forth between green and yellow. Uh, with the Dow, it's continued to be yellow. And with the S&P 500, today was the first day it went to the green moving average. Now, what a green moving average is trying to point out is the fact that in this case price is above a rising moving average and if we are going to have a trend reversal from bearish trends into bullish trends then it has to start with the stock or in this case the etf in question trading above its rising moving average and in the past we haven't really seen much of that behavior we had a little bit of a talk here at the end of um, February, beginning of March, where the Russell was already leading at that time. Remember, I was talking about how we were trading above the moving average, and it'll be interesting to see if it holds or whether it ends up failing like it did back here in the middle of February. Well, we now know that it failed. But notice the difference between when it was trading above the moving average over here versus what we see right now. Over here, you never once had the moving average turn green because during that entire time, that kind of one week window right there, price was trading above the moving average, but the moving average itself was falling. Um, and so this is different this time around. There's been enough kind of um, persistent bullishness in the Russell 2000 chart 
where now it's not just the recent price candles that have gone up like we saw back over here, but now we've had enough bullishness where it's actually started to bend the 30-day moving average higher. And also notice the separation between where we're trading right now and the moving average itself. There's a little kind of air pocket below the candles of the last three days versus where that 30-day moving average is. And we didn't really get that sensation back here. We were impressed that it could get above it, but notice how each one of those days during that week back here at the end of February, beginning of March, the Russell 2000 was touching the moving average. These last three days, uh, here today on Tuesday, there on Monday, and then last Friday, it hasn't even come close to sniffing that moving average. That's a positive sign because if you know market technicians wanted ex an excuse to sell it off and kind of have like the, the breakout retest theory, we're not seeing it yet. And it's not to say that it can't come, but it's just a positive sign there that we were able to hold those levels and now we're twisting that moving average back higher. So I think that's signs of great progress for this market. Now you always wanna keep an open mind, which is why we do these videos as often as possible when you're a trader, because things can and do change uh, fairly regularly. But right now, I will say that uh, my mindset towards the future is quite a bit stronger than it was just a week or two ago as a result of what we've just seen, which is really aggressive price action over the last week and what that has done uh, to the technical analysis that we look at every day. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that for the Russell 2000, this is actually the highest close since going back to um, January 18th. And that would have been that candle right there. On that day, we closed at 2096. We fell that day, but we closed at 2096 that day, which is slightly higher than the 2088 right now. Every other day that we've had since January 18th, we have not had a close as high as what we just witnessed today. We got close a couple times. Some of these other candles were just a little bit below it here back in early February and then mid-February. But today, from a closing price basis, is the highest level that the Russell 2000 has closed at since January 18th. Yet another sign as to why the Russell 2000 is this current market's leadership. If you were to look at that kind of same concept on the other charts, you would find that there were more recent dates where the market was trading higher. So for instance, here on the NASDAQ composite, it was trading higher probably right around here in mid um, in mid February, not mid January like the Russell 2000. With the Dow Jones, it was trading higher right in this time period, same time period as a matter of fact, mid February. For the uh, S&P 500, it was trading higher right back here in early to mid February as well. So none of those stretched all the way back to January 18th the way that the Russell 2000 did. So it's just, it's a way of looking at this information day after day after day and hopefully having some guidance from David and myself, like we've been sharing with you in the last several weeks, telling you that the Russell 2000 is stabilizing to then be able to witness that taking place when we do get some sort of a market reversal, which we're witnessing right now. So I continue to be impressed with the Russell 2000. It was not the day's biggest winner. It was up over 1% today, so that was more than the Dow, but it did not go up as much as the NASDAQ composite. But because it never went down as much as the NASDAQ composite initially, it needs less to recover and still maintain that leadership role. You'll notice that with the other charts, they do have the dark green background color as well, similar to the Russell 2000, but the difference there is the Russell 2000's green line is in the upper reversal zone to make it a strongly bullish posture. With the other three, they're also considered strongly bullish, but it's because the green line crossed above the 50th percentile and is traveling higher. Remember, once you're in the upper reversal zone, it doesn't matter if the green line is rising or falling. We would consider that strongly bullish. But in, in, the, in between zones, kind of in the, in the white zone between the pink and the green down below on the indicator, you do need to have that green line rising and it has to be above 50 in order to get that darker shade there. So we do consider all of our charts today strongly bullish, but it is the Russell 2000 that is the strongest of the strongly bullish with its green line in the upper reversal zone right there. Um, as mentioned before, the S&P 500 after today now 
now has a green 30-day moving average. So does the NASDAQ composite. So both of those can now be considered to be trading above rising 30-day moving averages, which means the Dow Jones is the only one currently that is not. Um, if the Dow Jones stays strong long enough, eventually that moving average will curl off as well if you know how a moving average works. In this case, you would basically just lop off whatever the 30th day back was and then add the most recent closing price and so on and so forth. And eventually that changes the shape of that lagging indicator. So uh, from that perspective, uh, you could probably say that the Dow um, you know, is not as strong at this moment in time as something like the S&P 500. S&P 500 was up 1.13% today. Again, that's the uh, fifth time in the last six days that it has closed up by 1%, an extremely rare event throughout history. Uh, we do have the Dow Jones up 0.74% today. And then the NASDAQ, as I mentioned before, was actually today's best performer. It was up 1.95%. So some really healthy signs of progress here in just one week. And it doesn't guarantee anything about the future. We don't offer those types of guarantees in this line of business, but it is healthy to see the consistent and persistent move to the upside because it gives you a sense that the bulls kind of got sick of just rolling over and playing dead and they're actually kind of fighting back here all of a sudden. Watched a lot of basketball here recently. And so uh, congratulations to some of the underdogs out there like in the men's bracket, St. Peter's Peacocks, uh, who would have thunk it, a 15 seed making it to the uh, sweet 16 there. And so uh, maybe this is the underdog type of a market that we're in. I would also uh, point out my congratulatory comments towards uh, my alum back at the University of South Dakota. Their women's team uh, took down mighty Baylor on Baylor's home court and the USD Coyotes are also advancing to the women's Sweet 16. So we'll be cheering them on here. Uh, great work there coming from some smaller schools you usually don't hear a whole lot about. All right, let's go ahead and take a look here at our next chart. Let's do some 12 grid analysis, starting with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. And a reminder that the background colors of these charts will turn either green or pink, depending upon whether the intermediate posture using that same market forecast technical indicator is either bullish or bearish, with of course green being bullish, pink being bearish. So let's kind of run through the charts and see what we can discover. You know, I think the story of the day continues to be what is happening with interest rates. This is one for the ages. My goodness, they just do not quit. Take a look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield in the lower right-hand corner here, and you'll notice that we were up yet again today in interest rates. Remember, the way you read this on the Thinkorswim platform is you got to move that decimal over to the left one spot on ticker symbol TNX, and that will tell us that we now have a 2.37% uh, yield on the 10-year treasury. That's pretty remarkable. It wasn't so long ago that we were down there at like one and a half percent. So uh, anyway, we've come a really, really long ways. Remember, a big part of the discussion for many developed countries across the globe in recent years has actually been the idea of negative interest rates. So while some of you that are newer to the markets right now might think that 2.37% doesn't sound like that big of an interest rate, um, it's all relative, right? And where we've come, some, come, come from in the more recent history, that is a very large number. It's the largest that we've had in a couple of years. Now, obviously, we're still a long ways away from where interest rates were back in the early 1980s, but um, this is uh, kind of a, a, a different picture than what many of us who have been in the business for the last couple of decades are used to. What we've been used to is falling interest rates. But um, with Jerome Powell, last week while I was away, um, offering up the first 25 basis point hike and suggesting that there's probably a lot more on the way, um, you're seeing the 10-year treasury yield as just one example react to that information there. And of course, most of you are aware that interest rates work inversely to bond prices themselves. 
And so we shouldn't be surprised at all to find that TLT fell today. Pretty substantial move lower by 1.28%. Notice that it did end with an oversold cluster signal today. But uh, just a reminder of the boy who cried wolf, usually throughout history, we haven't really identified TLT as being one of those boys who cried wolf. But in this particular case, you can see all these green dots that are showing up here in the last three months. There's been tons of them. And so um, when we get another one like we did today, um, we have to kind of weigh that information uh, versus the fact that we have an extremely robust and accommodating um, situation there with interest rates themselves. What I mean by accommodating is, is that the uh, Federal Reserve is effectively, you know, headlining the fact that they are going to be raising interest rates. So um, you, 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 sometimes you've heard that 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 saying, "Don't fight the Fed" or what have you. Um, this perhaps is what uh, you know that is kind of keying into right now. Bond prices are falling as interest rates are going up, and if you're trying to take the other side of that uh, bond trade, uh, good luck to you. Uh, it's a tough one uh, to get through, uh, particularly cons considering that not a whole lot of people have an interest in investing in bonds, even at these higher yields yet. But it, the question is. At what point will people become interested? You know, if we got to 3% on the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, would that interest people? We might actually start seeing some of those internet banks and even your, your local banks offering uh, greater rates on CDs and, and things like that, money market accounts all of a sudden again. It's been years since uh, we've seen any type of behavior like that, but we could very well be heading there uh, once again. And at higher rates, maybe just maybe there will be people interested in those types of investments. But for right now, uh, the trend is clearly to the downside in the bond market, whether you're looking at US bonds or even right here with foreign bonds. Both of those continue to have that strongly bearish posture according to the market forecast. Um, let's talk about crude oil prices here as well down below. You'll see that oil was actually down today, as was gold. But notice the difference in the two charts. This is kind of interesting as well. You know, um, a, a week ago, both of these were bumping up on their, you know, basically uptrending 30-day moving average. I talked about it in this very presentation a week ago. And uh, we talked about the idea that if you've been waiting for a pullback in these types of investments, this is your chance, right? If you assume that it will bounce up and off of those moving averages like so many charts end up doing, then that is your chance to buy it if you've been waiting for the, the, the pullback because this felt a little parabolic during this time. A lot of people don't like to buy uh, securities when they're going into a parabolic move. So had you been patient, you could have waited to back up the truck right here and buy crude oil in this case right at its rising 30-day moving average. And you have had a very nice kind of three or four day type of a bounce higher. Now we're not up and over those prior highs yet, but this would have been a pretty decent percentage win if you would have been bold enough to take that trade. So it is kind of interesting to see that that really wouldn't have been the case with gold. Now the good news on that discussion is you wouldn't have really lost any money on that either. Gold is effectively trading exactly where it was one week ago. So you might have bought gold and it went absolutely nowhere, but at least you didn't lose money. With oil, if you bought it, you would have made some money there. And um, that's not a guarantee that you would have done so in the oil stocks, but with the oil itself in the form of USO at least, who is an ETF that tracks kind of oil prices there, uh, you'd have done just fine. So don't, don't really know what to make of that so much, but uh, I do, uh, you know, continue to think that both of these still have upward trends. So despite gold having kind of a dark pink background color, I think if I were forced, I would rather be uh, bullish on gold personally at this level uh, for the intermediate future. Uh, let's say the next couple of months, especially if we continue to be in a higher inflationary environment. But I could very well be wrong as well. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time and it won't be the last. Uh, but right now, if I had to make that decision, I think I would prefer to be long gold here at 179 on GLD as opposed to shorting it at this price. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of make or break moment for it. And we could find out here within 
um, a pretty quick amount of time whether that would end up being a good idea or not because if it starts breaking through the lows of where it was trading here on March 16th then all bets are off then it's kind of giving you the impression that uh, the bears want to take over but right now you still are kind of holding out that hope that it's sitting right there on top of its rising 30-day moving average notice the green moving average line right there so uh, I'll be curious to see how things play out there uh, for gold moving forward in the in the next few weeks up here at the top, you will see that we have some green charts in terms of the stock markets from across the globe. Um, EFA uh, now has a strongly bullish posture. It was up 0.94%. And then we had EEM up 1.81% today, and it has a weekly bullish posture. There's been much more positive news, as you guys have probably seen with Chinese stocks here recently. That happened while I was out of town, but I was catching some of the headlines on my phone and different things like that, uh, where a lot of those Chinese stocks just started ripping higher. And so that helps EEM, as China is one of the most important, in fact, the most important country within the emerging markets. And you can see we had tons of those oversold cluster signals there a week ago. So all it took was for the Chinese government to come out and, and kind of half-heartedly say that we'll help support uh, our companies uh, that are publicly traded uh, elsewhere. Uh, and that kind of changed the fortunes for that asset class there as well. And uh, as I mentioned before, EFA has actually seen an equally as robust of a move, um, but it didn't have um, the direct negative impact of Russia. So that's, that plays a role there as well. Remember, as far as I know, I haven't checked this since I've been on vacation, but I, I, I would venture to believe that the Russian stock market is still closed at this moment in time. And therefore, that is a much more severe impact on EEM than it is going to be for EFA, where Russian stocks weren't really housed anyway. But it is good to see here, in this case, EFA, the, the developed foreign stocks, um, are back above their 30-day their moving average. Now, notice the, the color of the moving average is yellow. In this case, that means price is above a falling moving average. Then you compare that to the United States over here on the left, prices above a rising 30-day moving average. So you could get away with saying that um, you know the United States continues to be stronger than foreign stocks at this moment in time. You can kind of confirm that with your own eyes up above on the intermediate label for US stocks being 68, much higher than what we're seeing at the 59 there for EFA. We saw Bitcoin kind of stabilize today. It wasn't a real big day for Bitcoin. It's up just a, a few percent. Nonetheless, you do see a strongly um, bullish posture at this moment in time for Bitcoin, and it is above its 30-day moving average at this moment in time. So we'll see where it takes us. Uh, it's kind of been just kind of holding its own, it really, for the last couple of, of months. You've had some attempts to break out, some attempts to break down, but none of them have really held. You've really just seen sideways type of behavior with Bitcoin kind of around the, the $40,000 mark. So, you know, if that does break out or break down at some point in the future, we'll be sure to point that out. But right now, it's just kind of holding the line uh, more than anything else. All right, let's go ahead, take a look at our sectors now. This will be chart 5C, the US sectors 12 grid. Remember that this is a market cap weighted version of the sectors here in this case. So stocks like Apple and Tesla and others will have a bigger impact on these particular charts that we're seeing in front of us here. So as we look at these charts, the first thing that we probably all recognize is that all of these charts are green. Uh, that's a, uh, a nice, healthy change of pace. It wasn't too long ago, a few weeks ago, when most, if not all, of these charts were pink. And so that tells us that there has been substantial rebounds in these uh, particular charts, and it has changed the fortunes of the intermediate line on the market forecast technical indicator. Now, of the charts that are green, there are two that are lighter green, and that is communications up here at the top, and that is consumer staples down here at the bottom. And strangely enough, I'd probably have to go as far as saying that the consumer staples probably looks like the worst chart of the bunch. It's been a while since I've said that. 
Um, we talked about this already when we were reviewing the sector selector for the reasons that staples have been underperforming on a relative basis. But it's kind of interesting because earlier this year, the consumer staples were actually one of the stronger areas when the stock market was kind of going through its heartburn. And a lot of times money moves to defensive areas like consumer staples. Now that the market has roared higher for the last four or five days, a lot of these other more cyclical sectors are kind of leaving the staples in the dust. In fact, this is a, a quite precarious spot for XLP at this moment in time. You can see that the moving average line is still red, and that tells us that price is still below a falling moving average, just barely, you can barely make it out there. But um, point being, you had this nice rebound off of the oversold cluster signal that could very well end up being a dead cat bounce. For those of you that are brave enough, perhaps doing a bearish trade on some of the consumer staples companies at around these levels uh, could produce some fruitful profits for you. Uh, it's a little bit more dangerous in many of these other charts because they're now being supported by their moving averages themselves. Right now, we would say that the staples still are using the moving average as resistance as far as we know, but we could make the case that with a lot of these other charts, the moving averages could very well turn out to be um, support levels. In fact, you guys will recall that one week ago, I was telling you how um, the the healthcare sector was, re was looking really impressive to me at that time because it was already coming up above its moving average a week ago before this big, you know, um, you know, last several days rally that we've all been talking about. Healthcare kind of emerged bullishly um, earlier than the others. And you can even see that building upon itself when you just look at the candles right there. And you can also kind of use the same eye test that I, I, I helped you identify with IWM. And we were talking about that foregrid earlier in tonight's session. Just look at the length of time the moving average has been green on healthcare down here in the lower left-hand corner. Really, other than energy and utilities, it is the next longest from that perspective. Remember, energy and utilities were number one and number two on the sector selector, but healthcare, if my memory serves me correctly, I think was number five. So in other words, it's kind of sneaky and under the surface, and not a lot of people are paying attention to it, but this is an impressive move out of XLV. Not only have we stayed above that rising 30-day moving average for the better part of the last week or week and a half, but you can see that we've clearly blasted over our previous resistance area here on February 8th as well. Now we're back at another resistance resistance area from January 11th, but you can see that you know it wouldn't take too many more positive days before we're talking about healthcare being a real leadership group at this moment in time. So that one has been one that I wanted to share with you guys a week ago, and it continues to be today, to my own mind, an area where not a lot of people are paying attention to it, but it is an area that is garnering a lot more strength and some of it might be a bit hidden to the naked eye, but we're starting to recognize that using the tools that we show you here uh, during these videos. In yesterday afternoon's um, Options for Long-Term Investors class where I teach put selling, we actually looked at a healthcare company that to my knowledge, we have never looked at before. Um, and so that is a reminder that I, I mentioned a week ago as well that the new dividend stair step charts for charts 2A, 2B, and 2C are now available. And um, earlier uh, in earlier years, that particular stock was not overly close to the blue line, but with the fall in the market and with the changes in the calculations, we actually got a chance to talk about a new kind of blue chip type of a company that a lot of people admire that we haven't really had the opportunity to discuss previously. So just one example there of where we like to focus on these different types of sectors in different classes out there. Um, earlier today, by the way, I taught my dividend growth investing class. And in that particular class, we actually concentrate on the consumer discretionary space, looking at a couple of companies that we haven't looked at for you know, um, you know, a year or two, because again, same thing, where a lot of high quality companies have come down to attractive levels for long-term dividend oriented investors. So if you are a premium member of Market Scholars, feel free to go back and watch the recording there. Uh, David did teach his directional option strategies class as well. And then tomorrow, uh, we'll be back in action first thing in the morning as I'll be teaching my factor-based swing trading class um, at 11 a.m. 
Eastern time. All right, so let's get into our trade application example here for the day. And I'm gonna pull up chart 3A for this. Now, as I kind of alluded to earlier in the um, presentation, the most popular trade that I've done in the last two or three months by far, and it's not even particularly close, is selling puts. And that is a bullish trade, and I would do that repeatedly on terribly bearish days. In other words, I was not afraid to fade the market's movement from that particular day, I was willing to take the other side of that trade. Now, part of it is I've got flexibility as far as where I, I choose my strike there as well. So it's not maybe a perfect overlay, but I did wanna at least mention that when I tell you that today's trade application example was a short selling idea on ticker symbol GGG, and this is Graco Incorporated. A lot of people would say, well, wait a second, didn't you just get done telling us all these bullish things about the market? And that's true, uh, but the markets have been bullish for pretty much straight on a, a week at this point, and it makes you wonder, um, do we have enough steam to keep going at that pace? Um, and so I'm kind of fading the market here by doing a bearish trade, and because we have almost all bullish trades left in the portfolio, I don't mind doing bearish trades in a situation like this, even if I'm wrong, because I still know that my other bullish trades will um, will kind of compensate for that. And so, you know, I like to have a little bit of balance in these more active trading types of accounts like we feature here in the Market Outlook video uh, itself. So I wouldn't read too much into the fact that I did a bearish trade here today other than what I just mentioned there a moment ago. So let's talk through this particular chart on Graco. Um, first of all, I noticed that it was one of the rare stocks that was down today. You'll notice that it was down not quite a percent, but um, when I took the trade, it was. Uh, that'll come into play here in just a second as well. But um, when it, it was down a little bit more earlier today, I had noticed that its background color of this chart 3A had changed to pink from blue. And what that su suggests is that the near-term posture has now changed to bearish, right? With the intermediate um, trend lines that we use, the green lines there, that kind of covers a period of time where you expect to be in a stock or a trade for a couple of months. When you start switching to more of a swing trading mindset, you could get away with using the near-term blue line. It's a more sensitive line, but it does help for folks that are only planning on being in a trade for a few weeks. And that is kind of the expectation with this particular trade right here. So I was happy, first of all, to see that the blue line started rolling over today, in addition to the fact that this was one of the rare stocks that was down on a day when the market was up over 1%. You also have a company here that has a bearish engulfing candle after several up days in a row. So you had this oversold cluster signal result in kind of a dead cat bounce, and now we're starting to see a little bit of a struggle right around the moving average itself right there. So today's body fully engulfed yesterday's body, and that usually is a more bearish feature of a, of a, of a stock. And so we'll see if that ends up being the case here as well. Additionally, you'll notice all of these performance labels up at the top, except for the one year, remain red. The, the one year just barely managed to go green because it is technically up 1.87% over the last full year. But nine months, six months, three months, one month, and year to date, it is down over all of those time periods, giving us a sense that this is a stock that has been sold first uh, before uh, people get too far with their, their trades. Um, you will notice the S&P 500 dotted line on the chart is above this company's price candle. What that means is that had you had an opportunity to invest either in the S&P 500 or this particular company, Graco, three months ago, your money would have been better served being in the S&P 500. Now, the S&P 500 is also down over the last three months, but this stock is down even worse. In other words, this is a market underperforming security. And so kind of the same concept there, you, you, you wanna kick them while they're down, right? Just like you wanna buy the ones that are outperforming on the upside, you wanna you know kind of squash the ones that are doing poorly on the downside as well. So that's kind of the idea here. Um, so that was kind of somewhat interesting. Now, one thing that 
kind of changed after I placed the trade. So I placed the trade, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes before the market closed today. Remember, all of you who are premium members will have access to our Telegram uh, trade alerts uh, that feature the trade execution details. Um, it was like 20 minutes before the market closed, somewhere around there. Well, anyway, at that time, this stock was a little bit lower than where it ended up closing. So in other words, it rallied a little bit in the last 20 minutes. And usually a small rally doesn't really make a big impact, but I will just fully mention, in this case, it made a slight impact because when I actually placed the trade earlier here today, um, it was below its falling 30-day moving average. So we also had on an intraday basis, just 20 minutes before the close, this moving average tip was red. But because it did rally maybe you know 10 or 15 cents or whatever it was, um, that was just enough to get it back above that moving average. So then the, the moving average um, you know basically stayed yellow. I would have preferred to see that one red. So that's kind of a, a negative aspect of it, maybe a small fly in the ointment in that particular case. You could also maybe get away with saying that this one kind of gives you the sensation of a close below the low of the high day. If you look at yesterday as being the most recent high day in this move off the lows, um, yesterday's low price was 70.79. Today, this stock closed at 70.74. So in other words, five pennies lower than yesterday's low. So sometimes you'll hear us use that concept as a way to identify bounces. In this case, it would be looking for a bounce down. Um, from um, from from where it had been trading. So anyway, I put the stop loss up here uh, above some of these candles over here. So if it crosses up and through those, I'll be out of the trade, no harm done, uh, and then off to look for a different uh, trade. Otherwise, if it does what I want it to do, which in this case is for this particular stock to fall, you can see where my price target is down here at about 68 and a half, somewhere around that general vicinity. And so you can see it was trading at that level quite often just just a week or so ago. So if the markets stay bullish like we've seen here in the last week, then all of my other bullish trades should help benefit the account. On the other hand, if we've kind of gone a little bit too far too fast in the overall markets and they're due for a little bit of a breather, then this is an example of a trade that has some bearish features to it that you can try to pick on and, and, and play on the, on the bearish side of the coin. So that's what I had for you here tonight. Again, appreciate you guys checking out these videos as David and I cross over into our fifth year here at Market Scholars of teaching our premium classes. Thank you for all of your support along the way. If you want to say thank you for uh, the time that uh, went into doing the video here tonight, remember these videos take about three hours out of our day, even though they're completely free to you. Uh, all you have to do to thank us is click like for us there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes, by the time I go to do the video again on Thursday, I'll plan on doing another full-length video for you there. If not, we'll just plan on making uh, it a shortened 15-minute uh, quick hitter type of a video. So we'll let you decide collectively uh, what you'd want me to do there on Thursday. So with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.